Hello everyone, this is Paleo Nerd here with the third part of my Jurassic Fight Club analysis. In this video, I will be covering the third episode of Jurassic Fight Club, Gang Killers, going over the designs of the dinosaurs and the fight itself to determine what is accurate and inaccurate about it. Remember how last episode I said it would get better? Well, I was wrong. It's somehow getting even worse. The third episode, Gang Killers, takes place 115 million years ago, returning to Montana, and features a fight between a pack of Deinonychus and a herd of Tenontosaurus. So, what is Tenontosaurus? Discovered in Montana in 1903, Tenontosaurus teleti, or Tilet sinew lizard, referring both to the large network of stiffening tendons in its back and tail, in the Lloyd Tillett family of Lovell, Wyoming, is a species of iguanodont common throughout western North America from the Aptian to Albion ages of the early Cretaceous period, about 115 to 108 million years ago. Individuals can measure up to 6 to 8 meters or 20 to 26 feet in length, about 2 meters or 6.5 feet tall at the shoulder, and can weigh up to 2 tons. Like other iguanodonts, Tenontosaurus had the ability to run on its back legs for a speed boost to escape from predators. However, one unique thing about it which distinguishes it from other iguanodonts is its massive tail, which consists of about two-thirds the animal's body length. The tail would have been heavily muscled and may have weighed up to half a ton on its own, making it an effective weapon in addition to serving as a counterbalance. One swing from this massive tail would have been more than enough to seriously wound or kill any attacker, meaning that this animal was no pushover in a fight. Over 25 different specimens have been attributed to this animal, and it would likely have been a common sight in early Cretaceous North America. Now, how does Jurassic Fight Club portray this animal? Well, from what I can tell, it looks pretty accurate, as is the case with most of the herbivores in this series. The only inaccuracies I can find is that the Jurassic Fight Club version has a slightly different head and the feet are slightly off. The real problem is with Deinonychus. So what is Deinonychus? The first remains now attributed to Deinonychus were found in 1931 in Montana and were informally classified as Daptosaurus agilis. The animal would not get a formal scientific name until 1964 when paleontologist John Ostrom discovered remains of at least three individuals. However, only the complete left foot and partial right foot could be pinned down to one individual. And as such, it became a type specimen of a new species called Deinonychus anteropus, which means terrible claw with counterbalancing. After both the iconic sickle claws on the second toe of each foot, and the theorized use of the animal's long, stiff tail. This animal was a revolutionary discovery, setting for the dinosaur renaissance and the idea that dinosaurs were active and agile creatures and the ancestors of modern birds, rather than the slow, clumsy lizards they were originally thought to be. It was a pretty small animal, at only up to 3.4 meters or 11 feet in length, almost a meter or 3 feet tall at the shoulder, and weighing at up to 73 kilograms or 161 pounds. While it was likely a formidable predator, Dionychus was far from the top predator of its time. That title would belong to Acrocanthosaurus, a large carcharodontosaur that could reach up to 11.5 meters or 38 feet in length, over 3 meters or 10 feet tall at the shoulder, and weigh up to over 6 tons. Now, how does the Jurassic Fight Club version compare? First and foremost, Deinonychus and the two other dromaeosaurs in this series are entirely or almost entirely scaly, when all evidence points to these animals being covered in bird-like feathers. I will cover this more in my series-wide analysis, but basically Deinonychus should look more like a bird than a two-legged lizard. First off, 
The show says that Deinonychus was 5 feet tall and 8 feet long, which is about 2 feet taller and 3 feet shorter than, it, than they really were. The weight is pretty accurate though, at around 150 pounds. Now for the comparison, I couldn't find a good side picture, so I made my own. Besides the absence of feathers, the design fits the skeletal pretty well. The only differences I can see are smaller arms with pronated wrists, a head that's slightly different from the skull, and once again the feet are too lizard-like rather than bird-like. Finally, we have a major inaccuracy when it comes to dromaeosaurs in pop culture that I might as well address here. In several movies and TV shows, this one included, the hook-like killing claw of dromaeosaurs is said to be used for slashing and disemboweling prey. Now anyone who's seen the truth about killer dinosaurs can tell you that is inaccurate, but I'll explain why it's inaccurate. As I said before, the killing claws of dromaeosaurs are shaped more like a hook, and as such would have been about as good as sla at slashing prey as the dull side of a knife. Instead, most paleontologists believe cl the claws helped dromaeosaurs climb up trees, as well as to pin down their prey in a similar manner to hawks and other birds of prey. Some also believe that for larger prey, the claw may have been used to stab at the neck of its victim in order to sever either the windpipe or a major artery, similar to how the enlarged canines of saber-toothed cats are used. That's really it for physical inaccuracies, and they're pretty typical for dromaeosaurs. Now let's see how the fight plays out. The fight starts with a herd of Tenontosaurus on the move, not knowing that they are being watched by a pack of Deinonychus. I don't know how, as they are basically just screeching at the top of their lungs. These dinosaurs have no The raptors, the deadliest of all di Predators do not make noise when stalking their prey, because the element of surprise can make or break whether a kill can be made. Anyway, the Deinonychus watched the herd, looking for the weakest member, while both George and the narrator continually call them the deadliest dinosaurs ever. These dinosaurs have no idea they're being followed by some of the nastiest and most dangerous little dinosaurs that ever walked planet Earth. The raptors, the deadliest of all dinosaurs. I'll explain why this is inaccurate after the fight, but for now just know that it is. Also, real quick before you head back to the fight, both the narrator and George continually call these guys raptors. The raptors. What makes a raptor so incredibly dangerous is the raptors. However, the more appropriate term is dromaeosaurs. Raptors, scientifically, refer to birds of prey like hawks, eagles, and owls. Dromaeosaurs only got that nickname after Jurassic Park made Velociraptor a household name. Regardless, the pack hones in on one Tenontosaurus that's lagging behind, and then decide to rush in to scare the herd and separate their target. Pretty bad idea for a bunch of predators they claim are intelligent to charge head-on into a herd of large herbivores like that and expecting them to be scared. If you don't get it, imagine a group of jackals charging into a herd of rhinos and expecting them to scatter. It wouldn't end well for those jackals, and it wouldn't end well for those Deinonychus either. Somehow though, it actually works, and the Tenontosaurus stampede, leaving the target behind for the Deinonychus to attack. So by some chance, the Tenontosaurus actually considered Deinonychus a threat, and that's a very big if. They would absolutely do this, all the way up to the abandoning the weak to die part. Tenontosaurus and other large herbivorous dinosaurs really only lived in herds for protection and likely had little to no social bonds beyond that between parents and their offspring, and even that's a stretch. Leaving weaker members to die would allow the stronger members to reproduce, essentially becoming a form of natural selection in helping their species survive in the long run, even if the animals themselves are only running away to escape from a predator. 
However, we come back to problems right away, as George helpfully describes for us. Out of all the hiding places, the raptors rush in. The pack works in unison, much like modern day wolves do to bring down bigger prey. Once again, this is common for the portrayal of dromaeosaurs in media, and they say this repeatedly throughout the fight, so I'm just going to address it right now so I don't have to deal with it anymore. This might come as a shock to some of you, and don't worry, it kind of shocked me too, but stay with me. And take this slowly if you have to. Dromaeosaurs did not hunt in packs. Yep, Jurassic Park lied to you. Actually, there's a lot Jurassic Park lied about, but that's a topic for another video. Anyway, there is no actual fossil evidence that dromaeosaurs were social animals. I know I'll be getting comments like, but they found fossils of multiple dromaeosaurs in one place, so clearly you're wrong and I'm right, so blah. So take your hands off your keys for now and let me explain myself. Yes, there have been cases of multiple dromaeosaurs in one area, typically mixed in with some larger herbivore they were presumably eating. In fact, the whole dromaeosaurs hunted in packs thing actually came from the discovery of several Deinonychus buried alongside a Tenontosaurus. However, many paleontologists agree that these findings do not indicate true pack behavior, but are simply the result of disorganized mobbing, similar to crocodiles and Komodo dragons today. Simply put, Dromaeosaurs didn't have the complex brains of true pack hunters like wolves, who meticulously plan and coordinate their attacks. At the very most, the brain of a dromaeosaur was more like a crocodile or a hawk, both of which are primarily solitary hunters. Even on the rare occasions that Deinonychus might have grouped together to bring down larger prey, the attacks would not be coordinated at all less like one group working together and more like several individuals attacking the same animal at once. Once the job was done and the prey was killed, the Deinonychus would almost immediately fight over the carcass for the best parts, once again like Komodo dragons. In fact, many of these discoveries show that some Deinonychus were killed and eaten by the others, likely while fighting over a kill. Back to the fight. The Deinonychus start emerging from their hiding spots, focusing on inflicting as much damage as possible so that the Tenontosaurus can bleed to death. However, the Tenontosaurus isn't completely defenseless as it kills one Deinonychus with its tail. Strangely, George calls them harmless, but they're not defenseless. Harmless, but not defenseless, as if those two are somehow opposites. Tenontosaurus were very dangerous animals. Its sheer bulk defended it from most predators, and its massive tail could easily wound or kill anything unfortunate enough to get in the way. It would be like calling a hippopotamus completely harmless. Then George spouts out even more bullshit. One of the favorite attack methods of the raptors is what we call the slash and dash. Rush in, slash them with your hand claws, and you hope that you inflict a series of injuries and then you dash to safety. You allow your prey to slowly bleed to death. This method of attack would be almost completely useless for dromaeosaurs, since as I mentioned before, their sickle claws were not designed for slashing, and their hand claws and teeth wouldn't do much on the thick skin of a large herbivore like Tenontosaurus. They'd have a better chance praying for a rock to fall out of the sky and crush the Tenontosaurus to death than killing such a large animal in that fashion and expecting it to work. Next, three Deinonychus jump onto the Tenontosaurus's back, using their sickle claws in attack that might as well be a mass gang rape because of how ineffective it is at killing. In retaliation, and to keep his virginity, the Tenontosaurus rolls over, crushing one of the Deinonychus. Now, the narrator mentions that two Deinonychus have died. Two raptors now lie dead. But clearly forgot about one that was shaken off the Tenontosaurus and stopped moving earlier in the fight. 
Regardless, the Deinonychus decide they have lost too many members and withdraw as the wounded Tenontosaurus walks away. George then talks about how all the Pax attacks haven't worked, as if we're supposed to be surprised that attacks less effective than stabbing a rhino with a fork didn't work. Now, he also says they have lost too many members of the pack, but I see plenty still standing. So, being the super nitpicky guy that I am, I decide to see exactly how many members are in this pack. I analyzed every scene that the Deinonychus appeared in and counted every individual in the screen in each one, and have ultimately come to the conclusion that in this section of the fight, there is a maximum of six raptors on screen at once. But after the pack decides to retreat, there are four individuals still standing. So I guess the animators forgot about that one Deinonychus that is clearly also dead, because there should be only three left. If neither the animator nor the narrator can keep track of how many dinosaurs there are in one scene, then you know this episode is in, is in trouble. Now, this is where the fight should and would end, but I guess the producers feed on the murder of fake CGI dinosaurs because this fight is nowhere near over. Seriously though, three dinosaurs are dead already. That's almost the entire body count of the first two episodes put together. And they still aren't satisfied. Anyway, night is approaching soon, which is weird since just a few seconds ago it looked like the middle of the day. So the wounded Tenontosaurus looks for cover in the forest, with the remainder of the Deinonychus pack following it from a distance, rather than just going off to find easier prey that won't kill all of them. Also, the Tenontosaurus heading into a dense forest to take cover from Deinonychus would be about as effective of repellent as if it stepped onto a dinner plate next to a sign that said, Eat Me on it. Not only would the forest provide plenty of cover for the Deinonychus, it would also restrict the massive Tenontosaurus's movement, pre preventing it from properly defending itself. He'd be better off trying to find a herd where he could be protected and have time to heal. But who knows, maybe he wants to die. If that's the case, then he gets what he wants. The pack finds him again, apparently having picked up another member since there's five of them now, and use the darkness and the lightning storm to their advantage. They once again slash into his sides, with one even attacking from above, which is the closest this show gets to how Dromaeosaur is actually hunted. Four Deinonychus are killed. As he fights for his life throughout this horrific assault, the Tenontosaurus still manages to kill four more members of the raptor pack. Although there are somehow three left. So there's seven now? Where the hell do the other three come from? If we're supposed to believe that these are all from the same pack, then if we include the three earlier, the pack had ten members before the fight, yet only about half were contributing anything during the first part. Now, I thought group projects at school were bad. This pack is so terrible that half of them didn't even want to help or contribute to the kill. Anyway, the Tenontosaurus finally succumbs to the sweet embrace of death he was looking for, and George describes an alpha male. The alpha male raptor grabs the prey by the throat and begins to crush its windpipe. Despite the fact that real Deinonychus groups would have been nothing like wolf packs today, and as such wouldn't have a social hierarchy like wolves. So this alpha finishes off the Tenontosaurus by biting it by the neck, and the, three rem and the remaining three Deinonychus feast on the corpse, seemingly not caring at all that the uh, over three quarters of their pack is now dead. I guess the needs of the few outweigh the needs of the many. The Deinonychus do fight over the carcass, however, so that's another thing they got right. Now that the fight is over, let's go over the final inaccuracies that ultimately tear this episode apart. First off, we really need to finally address that whole raptors are the deadliest dinosaurs of all time thing. This show makes this claim throughout the episode about how dromaeosaurs are these super deadly predators that could kill anything. Another common misconception about dromaeosaurs you can blame Jurassic Park for. 
The truth is that dromaeosaurs are typically very lightly built, with the exception of larger dromaeosaurs like Utah Raptor, and thus are poorly suited for hunting prey larger than themselves. They also had hollow bones similar to modern birds which were incredibly fragile, making them glass cannons. Their weapons wouldn't have been very effective against large prey either, as their hand claws and teeth were poorly suited for cutting through the thick skin of large herbivores, and their sickle claws would have only been really useful for latching onto prey. Also, they were not nearly as fast as this show would like to have you think. George himself compares them to ninjas. What makes a raptor so incredibly dangerous is they're built like ninjas. They're fast, they're strong, they're agile, they've got razor sharp teeth. And when the truth is that dromaeosaurs were poorly suited for running very fast for long periods of time. Their legs are relatively short compared to long distance runners like ostriches, ornithomimosaurs, and even juvenile tyrannosaurs and as such it likely had a max running speed of about 10 to 15 miles per hour. They were still incredibly agile as the tails of dromaeosaurs were especially stiff, meaning they were perfect for helping them make quick turns and maintaining their balance. We've also established that dromaeosaurs lacked the capacity to hunt in organized packs like wolves and were likely solitary hunters. So what did they eat? Well, smaller herbivores, of course. Deinonychus coexisted with plenty of small or similarly sized animals that were perfect for hunting. These included small herbivorous dinosaurs like Aquilops and Zephyrosaurus, as well as small mammals like Gobiconodon. It also likely ate the young of other dinosaurs and even other Deinonychus on occasion. Finally, how Deinonychus hunted. Since they didn't hunt in packs, the method used in the episode wouldn't be very effective. However, recent evidence has suggested that Deinonychus may have hunted in a very interesting fashion similar to modern birds of prey. The main theory is that Deinonychus and other dromaeosaurs likely pounced on prey items from higher vantage points, like a rock or a tree. They would then use their sickle claws to hold down their prey while the prey was eaten alive before dying from blood loss and organ failure. This method is known as raptor prey restraint or RPR and is strikingly similar to how birds of prey like hawks and owls hunt today, except the Deinonychus can't fly. So sure, hunting in a large pack might seem scary at first, but consider which hunting method you think is scarier. A whole bunch of essentially giant turkeys trying to take down an animal the size of a rhinoceros by slashing it to death, or a giant bird of prey dropping on a poor herbivorous dinosaur, pinning it down with its claws as it slowly eats the animal alive. I don't know about you, but I'm leaning towards the second one. But being scary isn't all that matters, it's being accurate, and that's something this show seems to repeatedly fail at. So please, start thinking of Deinonychus less like a giant lizard that hunted in wolf-like packs, and more like a large groundhog with teeth and claws that attacks from above. Finally, before we get to what really happened, I want to explore this show's treatment of Tenontosaurus. A consistent theme throughout media is the portrayal of herbivorous dinosaurs, especially ornithopods like iguanodonts and hadrosaurs, as big wimps that serve as cannon fodder for the much cooler theropods. I can't even count the amount of documentaries that show iguanodonts and hadrosaurs being killed by a bunch of tiny dromaeosaurs simply because there's a lot of them. That would be like if, in the future, documentaries showed jackals hunting in huge packs and easily killing grown elephants. In reality, these animals would be incredibly dangerous, especially to dromaeosaurs. They were far from defenseless, as these animals were often very large and very heavily built. Tenontosaurus in particular could easily kill even a whole bunch of Deinonychus by sheer bulk alone and that's not counting its massive tail. So it is very likely that Tyrannosaurus likely didn't have to worry about Deinonychus that much. 
The only predator that Tenontosaurus would really have to fear would be Acrocanthosaurus. And even then it could probably put up a decent fight. Uh, this show does decently portray how well Tenontosaurus could defend itself. It still has the predators reign victorious at the end. Even though the Tenontosaurus killed off a vast majority of their numbers. It's actually kind of insulting if you think about it. What if dolphin people in the future start making documentaries about ant colonies taking down full-grown humans? You'd be insulted, and I bet there's a whole bunch of Tenontosauruses rolling over in their graves right now because of how poorly they are portrayed in media. Now we're on to the new What Really Happened section. This is going to replace the How to Make It Better section, since... All that's really going to be is me saying make it accurate, so I decided to do something different. See, something I forgot to mention earlier in this series is that Jurassic Fight Club was intended to be like a dinosaur CSI, analyzing prehistoric crime scenes and providing a simulation of what might have happened. Strangely enough, Dinosaur CSI is actually a documentary that is probably more accurate than this entire show. This concept seems great on paper, but in case you haven't noticed already, that concept was butchered and turned into a terrible Frankenstein monster of awesome broness that doesn't actually teach anyone anything. As such, the show's explanations of what happened are so extremely different from how actual real paleontologists think happened that I should have done this sooner. In the first episode, I pretty much unintentionally did this already, explaining how it was based off Majungasaurus bite marks and other Majungasaurus bones, and why Majungasaurus wasn't the Hannibal Lecter of dinosaurs, but I did do so for T-Rex Hunter. So before I get to gang killers, I'm going to briefly go over what crime scene T-Rex Hunter tried to replicate and where it went wrong. First, if you haven't watched my T-Rex Hunter video, click the card in the upper right corner and watch it right now. Or if you don't have the time, I'll just sum it up here. Also, if you want to skip this part and get to where I go over gang killers again, simply go to the time indicated on the screen to skip to that part. The fight consists of two juvenile T-Rex left by, behind by their parents who have to fend off an invading Nano Tyrannus intent on killing the two juveniles because I guess he's supposed to be a past reincarnation of Jason Voorhees killing off all those pesky teenagers since the Mesozoic era. The Nano Tyrannus succeeds in killing one juvenile but the mother returns before he can finish off the second one and kills him. Now, this episode is supposedly based off the discovery of juvenile T-Rex skeletons that showed evidence of bite marks, suggesting they may have faced a rather gruesome death. So, the producer of the of this show logically concluded that the only possible explanation was that they were killed by the dinosaur equivalent of Michael Myers, rather than, oh, you know, just being food for a larger and older T-Rex, a more reasonable explanation. But what do I know? I've only done months and months of research on the subject, while this show clearly had a paleontology expert Google some shit for like five minutes. So I might be a little off on that. In all seriousness, the most likely explanation is indeed that these juveniles were simply killed off by an adult T-Rex and then eaten. Something not out of the ordinary for Tyrannosaurs. But perhaps the weirdest part of this is that I've found no record of any discovery like this, meaning I'm not even sure if this particular discovery actually happened. If I am wrong about this, please correct me in the comments. But my theory is that the show intentionally made up this discovery just so that they could have T-Rex in the show and boost ratings. Now that that's over with, let's head back to the episode we're actually focusing on in this video, Gang Killers. As established before, this episode is based on the discovery of a Tenontosaurus skeleton surrounded by several individual Deinonychus, which led many paleontologists at the time to believe that the Deinonychus killed the Tenontosaurus and hunted in packs. 
However, this show forgets quite a few important details. One, the Tenontosaurus was not fully grown when it died, meaning even if the Deinonychus did kill this Tenontosaur, it only proves that they would have targeted juveniles and sub-adults, not fully grown individuals. And two, the Deinonychus preserved show evidence that they were killed and eaten, likely by other Deinonychus. So, with all that evidence in mind, I came up with a much more accurate version of what likely happened. First, a juvenile Tenontosaurus is killed, whether it's by natural causes or by a predator like Acrocanthosaurus or possibly Deinonychus. The smell of the carcass attracts a large number of Deinonychus, which start to fight over the carcass, much like Komodo dragons. Some individuals are killed in a struggle and are subsequently eaten by other Deinonychus. After the carnage is over and, sur and the surviving Deinonychus have had their fill, the carcasses left behind are buried by sediment, likely the result of a flooding river, and are almost perfectly preserved for paleontologists to unearth millennia later. There, now doesn't that sound better than the massive gore fest shown in the fight? Sure, it's not as cinematically exciting, but documentaries aren't supposed to be like big action movies. They should be focused more on teaching its audience r rather than giving them big gory action scenes purely for entertainment value. Overall, this episode is about as inaccurate as the previous two. At this point, it really doesn't look like this show is going to start redeeming itself anytime soon. But more than that, I'm greatly disappointed in this particular episode. It had a chance to help clear up the public's misconceptions about dromaeosaurs, but deliberately chose to portray them as the large bipedal lizards that hunt wolf packs that paleontologists know they never were rather than the truly amazing and beautiful creatures that they really were. All because they cared more about entertaining people with gory battles and scary monsters than about actually teaching people about dinosaurs and what they really are. That being said, I still have seven more episodes to cover, and they don't seem to be getting any better. That's all for today. Hope you learned something new. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to help support this channel. The next video will be a creature profile on Nanuxaurus, followed by my analysis of episode 4, Bloodiest Battle. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.